Hello everyone, my name is Xu Xiang Lu. This is my course project of WE216 at Stanford. Today, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the LEDs and what's so special about the blue LEDs. As we all know, LED is becoming an indispensable part of our daily life, including home lightning, automotive lightning, consumer lightning, etc. And earlier this year, at the International CES conference, Samsung released the first phone with a flexible OLED screen to the world. It's a really amazing product. Now you may wonder, what makes LED so popular? Here I listed several advantages of a regular LED. First, LEDs emit more light per watt than incandescent light bulbs, and its efficiency won't be affected by shape and size. Besides, they have a long lifetime at about 35 to 50 thousand hours, while regular fluorescent tubes can usually work about 10 to 15 thousand hours. Also, they can be made as small as about 2 square millimeter and can be easily attached to any PCB boards. Moreover, LEDs are ideal for frequent on and off cycling usage and they can be turned on and off really fast. Here, on the upper right is a schematic drawing of a regular LED. The PN junction diode is working under 4 bias, and this will cause large numbers of majority carriers. Electrons on the end side semiconductor to be injected over the reduced potential hill into the p-type region, and vice versa. When the electrons and holes are moving in the opposite direction, recombination is more likely to happen. The high energy electrons will lose its energy and combine with low energy holes. For direct semiconductors like gallium arsenide, the crystal momentum of the electrons and holes are about the same and a significant portion of the injected carriers is eliminated by band-to-band -band recombination. Therefore, the energy is mainly released in the form of photons and becomes the light produced by the LED. For indirect semiconductors, recombination takes place predominantly through RG centers, so that a huge amount of the energy released during the recombination process is in the form of heat. Well, the amount of the photon energy released determines the frequency, or let's say the color of the light, and the type of semiconductor material dictates the color of the photons as well as the efficiency and other performance characteristics about the LED. Basically, we conclude a semiconductor used to produce visible LEDs is subject to three requirements. It needs to have a direct band gap, a proper band gap energy, as well as being suitable to form a PN junction. Surprisingly, very few semiconductors meet all these three requirements. Here's a graph I quoted from the book Semiconductor Device Fundamentals. From the graph, there are only several materials are qualified as the LED semiconductors within the visible light region. Here, gallium arsenide is ideal except its band gap is too small. The three five compounds, gallium phosphate and aluminum arsenide, Band gaps uh, has the band gap in the desired range, but both of them have indirect band gap. Silicon carbide has a band gap of the correct size, but unfortunately, silicon carbide are also indirect. Some 2 5 compounds like zinc selenium are both direct and have a right band gap, but it's almost impossible to form a PN junction with such 2 5 compounds. Here's a timeline I made for the LED development history. From the very first LED being invented in 1961, LED industry keeps developing at a dramatically fast speed. However, you may notice that it took almost 25 years for the first, very first LED being invented in lab to the public market. What's so special about blue LEDs? Let's take a deeper look into this question. The first blue LED is made in 1971 used gallium nitride. The principal problem at that time was the difficulty of making strong p-type gallium nitride, and that's why it was limited in the lab scale. In 1989, a company named Cree introduced the first commercially available blue LED based on silicon carbide. However, as we mentioned before, silicon carbide has an indirect band gap. Therefore, Although a high-quality silicon carbide substrate was applied, the external efficiency was still too low due to the low probability radiant combination rate. In 1994, 
Shuji Nakamura, an unknown engineer from a tiny Japanese electronics company, successfully fabricated the first high brightness blue LED using indium gallium nitride and aluminum gallium nitride. Besides, a thermal annealing method was adopted, which was more suitable for mass production. Here's the structure of the first marketable blue LED by Shuji. For the blue light emitting devices, wide band gap nitride semiconductors are promising materials. However, because of the difficulty in fabricating the high quality gallium nitride active layer, the ternary compound indium gallium nitride was chosen instead. Indium gallium nitride is a good candidate as the active emission layer because its band gap can be tuned by the indium mole fraction so that we can control the LED color by a different doping level. Besides, a thermal annealing method was performed instead of the electron beam irradiation for the growth of indium gallium nitride on gallium nitride epitaxial layers, forming a more uniform, highly p-type doped gallium nitride layer with low resistivity. This could increase the production efficiencies by a lot and made and made mass product production possible. Just one year later, Shuji improved the substrate by using ELOC, epitaxially laterally overgrown gallium nitride. By using ELOC, the number of dislocations was reduced to almost zero, and this helps to reduce the leakage current for the diode and the reverse bias, which is critical for effective high voltage operation and long lifetime in high power LEDs. In addition, silicon is very attractive material also for the substrate due to its cost effectiveness in device fabrication and the nature availab availability and its mature technologies. However, it is difficult to get crack-free and high-quality gallium nitride on silicon substrate because of the large mismatches of lattice constant and thermal expansion coefficient between the epitaxial layer and the substrate material. One possible way to solve this problem is to pattern the silicon substrate. As you can see from the graph, these cracks only form on the substrate materials, but not on the epitaxial layers. Besides, a strong reduction in stress is also observed under this method. However, the disadvantage of such method is a comparatively high onset voltage. It can be as high as 3.5 volts and the high res series resistance as high as 350 ohms. Another approach using silicon substrate is to use two different buffer layers, aluminum nitride and gallium, ni gallium rich gallium nitride. Under this way, a high luminous intensity was observed with the low onset voltage and a low series resistance. This makes silicon substrate a possible candidate for mass production. Well, if you think our LED is already perfect, I'm afraid you have to think that again. Those LEDs perform at their best only at low power. The few milliamps to backlight the little screen may be on our cell phone. When we crank up the current to a certain level, the efficiency will plummet. The problem is known as droop. And unfortunately, up to now, the reason is still unknown. Even Shuji Nakamura himself can't agree on the causes of the phenomena. One suspect is heat because heat will cause droop in arsenide LEDs, but researchers rule out this possibility after noting that nitride LEDs are always suffering from droop even when driven by short pulse voltages with enough time for the device to cool down. A second suspect comes from the structure of the quantum well. Shuji Nakamura found Indian rich cluster regions in the semiconductors. He proposed that under high power, those indium rich regions will become saturated and kill the light emission. Unfortunately, this reasoning was also found incorrect later since the cluster regions was only the byproduct by of the measurement by TEM. They were actually not there. A third mechanism is the Auger recombination. We have learned this in class before that when electron is combined with hole, the energy is released not in the form of photon but to excite another electron in the conduction band. This model is claimed to fit the experiments very, very well, but there are still doubts in it. Moreover, polarization fields are claimed to drive electrons 
out of the active region, especially under high power situation, which kills the recombination and light emission. Although we don't have a universally agree upon theory to fully explain group, I believe the industry will keep moving forward and we will develop more weapons to fight against it. Thank you.